Um, I've said it before, and you're going to hear me say it every time that uh, that we're in this track. Uh, we could not have done what we're doing today uh, without the incredible support of our sponsors. And so, want to walk through them yet again. Uh, at the Diamond level, Warner Media. Uh, at the Gold level, uh, Kennesaw State University, Coles College of Business, my my home college where I do my day job. Uh, the KSU Department of Information Systems, my home department where uh, allegedly I do some teaching every once in a while. Uh, Bishop Fox, Coal Fire, uh, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR. Uh, at the crystal level, Synopsis and Patrick Kelly and, and Critical Path, his video you just saw. Uh, at the silver level, Aaron's, Binary Defense, Black Hills Information Security, Corelight, and Guidepost Security. Uh, additionally, at the bronze level, the NCC group. Uh, Want to also thank uh, some in-kind sponsors. EC Council uh, came through yesterday with uh, some online paid training for some of you uh, who I think might have taken advantage of that. And also Secure Code Warrior today uh, for copying or, or for uh, setting up and, and staging uh, the CTF that is actually uh, happening right now in another channel. Um, we would also like to thank uh, the following individuals and organizations for contributing to our raffle prize effort. Uh, Mike Costa and Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, uh, Information Security, and Pentester Lab. And so now I'm going to reach over here and grab my piece of paper. Uh, and so that brings us to our next speaker today. Uh, to, uh, next talk for the next uh, 55 minutes is Wes Lambert. And Wes's talk is entitled Connecting the Dots, Detecting Threats, and protecting the enterprise with security. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Okay, Wes, are you ready to go? Yep, yep, give me just a second here. All right, so welcome to Connecting the Dots, Detecting Threats, and Protecting the Enterprise with Security Onion. I'm Wes Lambert. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about really how organizations can leverage Security Onion. Uh, with uh, facing some of the common problems that, that they see in, in their environments. Uh, to give you a brief overview about myself, I am a senior engineer at Security Onion Solutions where we develop and maintain Security Onion. I'm also a husband and father of four, uh, awesome kids and, and wife. And I also enjoy long walks on the keyboard, breakfast tacos, and of course, Ed Bassmaster. I mean, who wouldn't, right? I mean, look at this. So really, what are some common challenges that, that organizations are facing today with regard to security and monitoring in their environments? I'm gonna talk about a couple of these um, and not really dive a whole lot into every single one, but uh, you know, just give an overview of each one and, and how we might be able to address that with security in it. So one of the main things is limited visibility. A lot of organizations maybe don't have the budget or just don't have the expertise or um, just by whatever reason don't have great visibility into either their endpoints or their network traffic. They might run stuff like Microsoft Defender, right, um, and, and get those alerts as AV alerts. But a lot of times whenever we get these alerts and it says something bad is happening on our workstation, how do we confirm that it's really bad, right? Or if it is bad, is it really the only bad thing on the workstation has that workstation that is potentially infected could it have communicated with other workstations or other servers um, could you know could that bad thing have moved from one place to another and this really becomes a bad situation uh, overall for analysts right security analysts or IT administrators when they're not sure what is really going on in their networks when they don't have a clear picture when the lights are off and they can't see a thing it's really difficult to make these decisions in a timely manner again i mentioned the budget um, and this isn't a dig on commercial tools at all there are some great commercial tools right like uh, of course you know splunk is is free to a certain degree and it's very uh, capable at the enterprise level uh, but unfortunately, a lot of InfoSec departments or smaller companies with maybe one man shops or a couple man shops or even with larger teams than that just simply can't afford these tools, right? Organizations are forced to pick and choose between which capabilities they want to implement in their environment and it can still lead to gaps in visibility. And 
you know, when we're able to address that as much as we can with open source tools, we'll try to do that. Another thing that, that we run into and that we commonly see is the fact that companies have these disparate data sets. Uh, they have all these systems um, that are their own system of record for this thing. And you have to jump from this system to this system to see a particular bit of data. Uh, when you're investigating, it's very disjointed. Um, it's really easy to miss critical data. And it's not really easy to, easy to connect the dots between what's going on, right? You have all these disparate systems. And another thing is if they're in a separate time zone, right? Or if you're not using UTC, it makes it even worse. And even further, a lot of the setup for these various tools, whenever you have these disparate data sets, you have to have that, that specialized expertise, right? It can be time consuming and it just, it doesn't fit well to the overall, overall scheme and integration uh, organizationally uh, for that security monitoring. So what would an ideal scenario be, right? We think about the things that we'd really like to have uh, and, and maybe, you know, we can make those available. So one of the things might be network traffic, right? Collect all the network traffic as it occurs on the wires so we get that full conversation. Another thing, network metadata, right? The metadata about the traffic like bytes, right? Um, you know, file sizes or, uh, you know, summary data, right? Like, like how many times does this host connect to this host and just lots of other stuff. And then also host-based telemetry adds to that, right? From Linux, Mac, Windows endpoints, and really being able to correlate that between all this traffic would be awesome. Going further, being able to perform analysis on files extracted from network streams, that would be pretty cool, right? If we can enrich data as we feed it into a log management pipeline, helping us further enrich that and provide that context, giving us a better overall perception of our network, that would be great. Or what if we generated alerts? You know, we wanna generate alerts for noteworthy events we want to develop custom policies and detection rules that go further beyond maybe static NIS rules or, or similar things. And what if we want to be able to perform the triage of those alerts, right? Have all that context right there tied together and perform that threat hunting when we go in and look for anomalies. And what if we want to be able to be extensible and be able to integrate with different commercial and open source tools? What if we want to do that, be able to do that easily, right? Without proprietary uh, intermediaries. Well, the truth is pretty close to ideal is real. And the way that happens is with security onion. So with security onion, we can take the, this ideal scenario and for the most part, we can put it to play for free, right? We can peel back the layers of our network. Security in itself was founded in 2008 by Doug Burks. Again, it's completely free and open source. Uh, we use it for enterprise security monitoring, intrusion detection, log management, threat hunting, lots of different stuff. And it's super easy to set up if you're doing it in your home lab or in your enterprise network. You simply install the security in ISO. We also have Ubuntu uh, PPA. So you can install the packages on your flavor of Ubuntu. And we take that data from the network, uh, from a network tap or span port, and we feed it into security and then we run through that setup and you're monitoring in minutes, just pulling back, turning the lights on, uh, data from your network. But really, what are the tools and, and data behind security and then that allow us to be able to do that? One of them is gonna be Zeek, also known as Bro. Uh, they recently changed their name. And Zeek is a policy neutral uh, network based intrusion detection system or NIDS. And some of the data it can provide is that extracted content data when we're talking about files, images, or media extracted from network streams. Session data, those high level communication details that we were talking about before, getting a, an idea of the, the types of traffic going on in our network at a high level. And also a little deeper into transaction data. So for example, HTTP traffic. FTP traffic, we can drill into the details of those rather than just the summary details. Additionally, the asset data provided by Zeek can be very helpful. Uh, so we can grab things like device software versions, right? If somebody's running 
uh, some particular, they've got some particular version of Adobe or Java installed. We can see that uh, like cold fusion, if their devs running uh, development servers in their environment and you don't want them to right? Um, lots of different things that we can see there. Then we pair that with another network-based intrusion detection system, your choice of either Snort or Suricata. And these, these tools provide that alert data that we talked about, where we're generating IDS alerts. It's gonna alert you when a predefined rule or um, you know, set of conditions has been matched again in this network traffic, and it's gonna alert us to that. We also include Wazoo. So Wazoo is a fork of OSEC. If anybody's used OSEC before, it's a host-based intrusion detection system. And we get a lot of great host telemetry data or can get that with Wazoo. So we can, we can ship Windows logs, right, with Sysmon. We can do that using Wazoo. Uh, and we can also have Wazoo analyze those logs and generate alerts based on that data. Aside from that, there's some great plugins or uh, capabilities with OpenSCAP and also active response. And we can also perform file integrity monitoring on the systems that that Wazoo agent is installed on. And each security onion node itself already one, runs Wazoo. So it already performs that active response. If you've got people trying to hit your box, if they're not supposed to be, right? Or uh, it's already logging that file integrity monitoring or performing that file integrity monitoring to alert you if anything strange is going on in the box. That's another great feature. And then NetSniff and G. Again, we talked about that full packet capture or capturing all that traffic off the wire. We get that full content data and we can see the entire conversation. And when we're ready, when we're looking through logs in Kibana or uh, going through Squirt or Squeal, uh, we can view that transcript via Catme. And it's really helpful to be able to view that, you know, that conversation right there as you're investigating logs and not having to go to a separate system. And then also with the PCAP, we can export to various tools or perform further analysis with other tools that either we provide or that you may have yourself in your environment. Also, the Elastic Stack. We run Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana to perform the data enrichment, the indexing, and the visualization for all the data that Security Onion throws in to, uh, into the pipeline. So we're able to take that metadata aside from the raw data on the network sensors themselves and that way you still retain that raw data on the sensors, right? If you want to go back and perform retrospective analysis, um, and then you've got that metadata that's enriched, right? You've got other stuff that you can go do with either Logstash or Elasticsearch to uh, make that data speak to you more or provide more context. So we have a lot of flexibility there. Also using Elastalert, we can query Elasticsearch. If we want to send alerts to an email, Slack, or the Hive, maybe. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you folks have either heard of the Hive or used the Hive. Uh, very cool tool. Um, we can, you know, we can query on Windows of NIDs, um, pretty much anything you can query on in Kibana itself. And you can alert on certain frequency of events, whitelist, blacklist events. There are lots of different rule types for you to be able to utilize. And it's all in YAML syntax. So if you're familiar with YAML, then it should be very familiar to you. And then aside from those tools and those data that, that Security Onion provides, there are several different use cases where we can use Security Onion to help us uh, either investigate something or protect our environment. One example would be an evaluation mode. We provide a, an evaluation mode for maybe businesses who want to set up a POC to uh, prove intent or to uh, prove that they can go forward with the project. Maybe for academic instruction, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of universities that have cyber ranges and a lot of them love to use Security Onion for that academic instruction because it's very easy to set up and it's very easy to walk through an attacker scenario. Additionally, home lab testing, a lot of folks like to have their own home lab. It's very useful. You know, even aside from really the lab perspective, but to monitor your own home network and be able to see the traffic. And, and you'll be very, very interested in some of the traffic that comes from those IoT devices and, and how crazy some of it looks, I'm sure. And then as part of that evaluation mode or uh, you know, that, that kind of line of thinking, we also have a SS setup minimal script that runs and it's a modified version of the 
uh, native setup script and allows you to run Security Onion with only two cores and four gigs of RAM. So if you have students or yourself, you have limited resources, it really helps to allow you to set it up quickly and start experimenting and start getting the data and really losing yourself in all the, all the cool stuff. Additionally, other use cases might include a production deployment. Uh, there are a couple different models that we utilize with Security Onion. Uh, one of them, and really the most popular and recommended model would be that of a distributed model where you have a master server, which really acts as the, the master of, uh, or really the, I'm sorry, the manager of the grid, right? You perform that grid management. You can distribute rules. You can push files, um, you know, orchestrate actions. Uh, and then it's also a relay for the data that comes through from the forward nodes. So those forward nodes are going to be picking up that network data. They're going to be performing those sensor processes, that sniffing, that collection. And then that's going to be sent off to that master server. And then each storage node is going to pick out of the queue on the master server. And then you can snap in as many storage nodes as you want as your business grows. And it allows you to scale very well and to be able to store data for longer and perform searches more quickly uh, and that kind of thing. Additionally, that standalone is the all-in-one. Uh, we don't necessarily recommend using a standalone unless you're doing it for testing or unless you are, uh, have a very low throughput environment, but that's another option, as well as the heavy node, which is just a forward node and a storage node that you can kind of take one box out of the equation and just have that master and heavy node communicating. Um, again, we don't necessarily recommend it just because we'd like to separate the sniffing processes from the indexing processes just from the, the IO and, and resource perspective, but uh, that is another option. And yet another one, an analyst VM. So say you want to install the security in an ISO, uh, you can install that in a VM and you can have your own self-contained analysis platform. This way, whenever you're going and looking in Kibana and you're pulling down PCAPs and you're looking in Network Miner and you're looking in Wireshark, uh, you can carve out files without risk of accidentally running those files or having AV pick up those files and do something with those files. And it contains the necessary tools for us to be able to still, in an enterprise, triage those alerts, right? With either Squeal, Squirt, or Kibana, dissect the packets and do whatever you need to as an analyst. And this is what we typically recommend for those, um, you know, whenever they can, to use an analyst VM to access their core infrastructure. And then another use case would be that of the event conduit. Uh, so with Security Onion, and, and really the Elastic Stack helps us to leverage this a lot, uh, is the ability to send logs to Splunk. We can send logs to another Elastic Stack or SIM, S3, anything with an HTTP endpoint. HTTP endpoint. Uh, really, it's, it's kind of up to your imagination. Um, there's just a lot of ways that, that we can still collect that data. And if you have another SIM or data lake that you want to throw that into, we can help with that as well. And then I mentioned the analyst VM that kind of ties in with forensics. Um, if you want to analyze a specific PCAP or multiple PCAPs, we can use the SO import PCAP command. And what that's going to do, it's going to allow us to take that PCAP and read it in with the native timestamp, uh, as opposed to TCP replay. If you were to replay the packet, it would not per, uh, preserve the original timestamps. Uh, so if we had a, a PCAP that somebody wanted us to look at, we can go back you know, retroactively import that and we can do that uh, you know, from the correct timestamps and whatnot. So I know it talks a whole lot about you know, what security and can do, right? And, and how we can leverage that and the different use cases and the tools and data. But really, I think the value comes whenever you're able to see the components work together, um, you know, have that context and be able to have that visibility into your environment. And so with that, I'd like to start off with a little bit of investigation. Uh, I am going to disconnect this particular screen real quick and pull something up, unless I can pull that over. Let me see. Uh, let's see, is that it? All right, give me just a second here. Okay, so, so this right here, what I'm, what I'm showing on the screen is after running SO import PCAP, uh, and what we have right here is a Security Onion Analyst VM or just a dedicated VM for analysis that I've stood up um, with the Security Onion ISO. 
And once I've stood that up, I ran so import pcap to prepare the box so that I can then import whatever pcaps that I want to look through. And after that, I've really only imported one pcap uh, because the situation here and, and the story with this is, is uh, my boss gave me this pcap and, and just wanted me to look at this um, because he had some folks that weren't really, really sure about the situation and really just wanted to get my thoughts on it without, without really putting too much into perspective for me. So what I've got right here is after running SO import pcap, uh, Kibana, the overview dashboard and security engine, you'll notice it's not super populated right now. That's because I've only imported that one pcap and it only happened at this one point in time. So we'll only see those logs relevant to this. But if you were monitoring your, your network, of course you would see that steady flow of data and you'd see a lot more mixed in here. So this is more of an academic use case, but uh, should still be applicable to give you an idea of how it performs. Right, so we've got this overview dashboard and we've got these different log types here. Uh, we'll break these out. Uh, you can see different uh, Zeek types. We still name them with the bro extension on the back end, so you'll still see that. But we can see that we've got some files logs, some connection logs, uh, some HTTP records, and some DNS records. Uh, and we can also see on the left-hand side that we've got a lot of links that we can click here. And these are really example dashboards. Um, we encourage a lot of folks, whenever they use security in and set it up uh, in their enterprise, to exper experiment with these dashboards. Uh, because they aren't necessarily one size fits all, right? Um, they do have some useful visualizations on each dashboard, but really we want folks to get accustomed to building their own dashboards and really doing what works for them. But as you can see, we've got different details on these files and then on these HTTP records in here. I'll take just a second here. This VM is not the quickest. All right. And so we, we can see some different details, source IP address, destination IP address, all in these different dashboards. Uh, but really right now, I just want to take it back over to that overview dashboard real quick and, and zoom in on something that I noticed right off the bat. So let's click home real quick. Take just a second here. All right. so. We can see that we have some snort alerts here. And really, this is just an identifier for snort or suricata uh, NIDS alerts. So we see that we have a few of those there. And just because it's kind of easy pickings, I'm going to take a look at those first real quick and, and see what's up with those. And we present those actually down here in addition to other, some of the other summary data. And I can see right here that that source IP, uh, again, is the same. That's really the only source IP for the most part that I see in all of this communication that we were looking at. Um, so with this right here, this source IP address is hyperlinked. So we can take that to the indicator dashboard, right? And by default, the indicator dashboard is going to show the last 24 hours, but we can quickly and easily change that. And it's going to take just a second here, uh, just in case that takes a second, because um, again, this VM is slow. Um, I'm going to go over here. So this is where I've, I've pivoted before over to this indicator dashboard, right? And we can see again some different details, some more summary data. Uh, we can see some different types of services. Uh, we can see again the alerts. Um, but what I'm interested here, and, and this is again uh, showing the source IP really of just this host that we're interested in, um, is kind of building a timeline, right? A timeline of activity. And uh, to do that, I really like to scroll down um, and, and really, you know, in Discover as well, you can do this, but I like to specify, uh, you know, toggle some specific fields that I want to look for uh, in this traffic so I can get a better idea. And as this is uh, incrementing the timestamp, I can see kind of what happened at, at what time and correlate that with the other traffic. All right. So right now, let me put this back in here. It doesn't look like I have the query in here. So I probably want to see a query for DNS. So I'm going to toggle that. Right, and now I'm gonna pull that over here just to make it a little easier to read here. All right, come on. Once again, put that over here. Da -da, slow rolling. All right, and I'm just gonna pop this over here and one more. All right, so 
right now, I'm going to collapse this and we can get a little bit of an idea of what's going on here, right? Without anything else, any other knowledge, uh, just starting from the beginning, we can see that a query has gone out to or for uh, free to speak me. Okay, that's, that's kind of strange, but um, you know, I mean, what else happened, right? Um, so we've got these other connection records. Um, these connection records are really going to be associated with each of these transactional records. Uh, so there's not gonna be a lot at this time that I really wanna look at, uh, unless I wanna dig into uh, more summary details. So I'm just going to negate this value on the event type. All right, now it's a little bit clearer, right? So we've got some DNS and some HTTP traffic and we see that query for free to speak dot me. All right, and then we see a get to free to speak dot me, right? To this URI, this 0843 underscore 43 dot PHP. Okay, I mean, that's nothing too crazy so far, right? Um, but you know, if we wanna get a little bit more detail into that, as I mentioned before, we do have that full packet capture available. So if I want to go over to CAPME and pull the TCP's transcript for that, I can get a little bit better idea of what's going on there. Okay, so we see that get to the 0843 underscore 43.php. And then we see a return, right? It looks like a binary, or I'm sorry, not a binary, a zip. Okay, so we have a PK here. And then we had this zip extension here. Okay, so maybe somebody downloaded a, a zip file, right? So let's go back. Um, it's a little, you know, people download zip files all the time. So let's go back. All right, so they got that. They went there. The file was downloaded. We can see our bro files record here. But following that, just after that event, we also see a call to IP defy.org. Okay, or I'm sorry, not a call, but a DNS query right here. And then further down, we see the actual get to ipifi.org. Okay, um, you know, there are a lot of services that use external IPs, right, that in businesses. Um, but given that, you know, we kind of have this isolated PCAP, maybe we should just take a look and see what's going on there. Okay. So we do see that get for the api.ipifi.org. Then we do see an address return. Okay, so there's an external address return, not a big deal. But let's see, let's walk it a little more. Uh, okay, so we see some bro files. That's really gonna be that, that plain text uh, that was returned by the ipfi.org. And then we also see, it looks like a DNS query for some eks.com. Okay, all right, well, I don't know what that is, but it seems okay so far. But if we go, oh, you know what? I'm gonna back up real quick. So one of the snort alerts that we saw previously, um, this did trigger after the IP lookup. Uh, it was that IP lookup uh, API, uh, ipifi.org. Uh, so just throwing that out there, that kind of correlates with what we saw earlier, right? And again, that thumb eks.com, we see a post to that. Okay, well, it was all cool until we kind of saw this post, right? It seems a little strange. Um, seems like it could be reasonable, but you know, let's let's go ahead and check it out and see what that looks like. Okay, well, well, that's a little different, right? Hmm. Looks like an actual GUID is being posted to this server, and then. Base64 encoded string is returned. Okay, well, can we look at this? I mean, does this make any sense to us? If we, maybe we wanna go over to CyberChef. So uh, we host a local uh, instance of CyberChef with Security Engine. Maybe we can pop that in and see if it gives us anything good. Mm, not really, I mean, I'm not really sure about that. So let's go back. Oh, wrong one. All right, so exit out of there. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so it's taking a second here. It's just loading up. But um, 
we'll go back there and let me refresh this. Pray to the demo gods. But again, it, you know, it's, it's kind of strange with, with that base64 encoded string and that posting of that GUID, it's, it's certainly not typical behavior. At least I, I wouldn't assume so. So let's see, let's give it a second here. My, my, poor, uh, my poor undersized VM here. All right, and let's go back down and continue. Start off, oh, so we have to switch back. Let me switch back over to this. Nope, nope, yep. Make sure we specify the correct date for these records. All right, we're back in business. Okay. So I'm gonna scroll back down to the bottom. Mm -mm. And do we filter, let's see what we filtered on. There we go, all right. Sorry for that, all right. Well, regardless, so it looks like our, our filters uh, have been since removed, but uh, that is, oh, here we go. Sorry, wrong tab. Um, so we'll go over here back over to the thumb EKS post to the 4.4 MPHP. Okay, now that's definitely really strange. Um, we definitely wanna follow up on this activity and, and see what else might've happened. So we see a DNS query for shopartainfinity.com. And we see this get request right here, right? For shopartainfinity.com and this sodium compat one. So, all right, let's get this straight. So it posted this GUID to this URI right here. And now it's calling out this URI right here. Let's see what happened. Interesting, okay. So it looks like we're getting a file called one and it's a binary. So it returns okay. So that file is transferred over to the client. And then what do we see? A DNS query again for thumb EKS. A post to thumb EKS at a different URI. Let's see what happened here. Interesting, so now we're posting binary data to another endpoint. I'm not sure if this, this is beginning to look familiar for, for anybody, but uh, we'll, we'll keep going here. And we'll, we'll keep kind of following the, the trail here. Let me go ahead and close out of this. All right, so we've seen it then post binary data to this URI after getting a binary from the other URI. And now we're seeing it getting, it seems like another file possibly from that same URI or from the root URI. Okay, that's interesting. Let's close that out. <clears throat> Let me keep going down. Uh, of course, we see the bro files associated with that. Bro files is going to um, if there are any file names associated with that, it's going to populate them here, and it's also going to show you that source IP from which the file came, and we can see that there. And then we also see after that previous get, we see another post to D2 about that PHP. Now, what is that? Another binary post. Okay, interesting. So as you can see, with the data collected from uh, not only Zeke and Suricata, but also NetSniff and G, we're able to tie this together and start to connect the dots about what is going on here. We're already uh, building our, our trail of evidence here and, and kind of our, our timeline to see what's going on. Okay, so we see that post there. And then immediately after there, we see three more posts. 
to the same server and the same URI. But let's take a look at each one. Okay, another post of the GUID and a base64 encoded string returned. Okay, interesting. If we let's see if we pop that in CyberShark, if we or not CyberShark, CyberChef. Goodness, making up tools. If we get anything useful, uh, and not really, uh, not a whole lot there for us to go off of, uh, unless we already have some familiarity with with something that that might be related. So, let's go off and. this thank you cat me and chromium all right okay and then we see the same thing here another good posted uh, looks like the same good and a different string um i don't know about you but um this is kind of starting to look like like c2 right uh even so a few few uh, uh interactions before but you can see that these strings are different you know, maybe uh, different commands, and whatnot, right? And then let's look at this last one here. And if we compare that, it is also different. <clears throat> so that's interesting. So we've got all these series of events, right? This, you first we got this file, and then we posted. Uh, this data to this endpoint. And then you've got all these other series of events occurring, right? And we, we're kind of building our, our trail here. And while we've got some interesting items here, we don't really have anything that's, that's super conclusive. Um, so maybe we want to dig a little bit more uh, into the PCAP that we had and, and look at the files contained within it. We can do that on our security and an analyst VM. And let me just pull up. You can do that using uh, various tools. You can use Wireshark, or if you want to use Network Miner, uh, that is one option. So right now I'm going to use Network Miner to load in uh, my PCAP, and then it's going to present me with some files that it extracts out of there. Now, if you're already performing Zeek file extraction, uh, or you're, you know, you're doing some other uh, method of file extraction, then uh, of course you would already have this extracted. But for this academic use case, we're going to use Network Miner. So we can see also uh, some different uh, communication details for these hosts and then some files that were extracted out. We've got uh, that zip file that we saw before. Uh, we've got a couple of different PHP and HTML files. We've got a couple binaries, that one binary and that two binary that we talked about. And then from here, if we want, we can go into here, into the folder, and we can actually see if we can extract that here. Right, and we can make, uh, you know, we can certainly hash these and and check these with VirusTotal along the way, uh, certain files to to see if there's any inkling of information that can lead us along that path. But it looks like extracting that zip file, there's a VBS file here, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, I wouldn't normally expect that with normal traffic, and, and certainly given these series of events, um, it definitely falls in line with the weirdness factor. So we can open that with Vim. Right, and right now we see a bunch of different stuff that's really hard to read, right? The split function, a uh, variable that's um, gonna be potentially read in later. Uh, but if we scroll down and see if we can get some logic. Okay, okay, we got some logic here. So it looks like some, you know, just some VB here, VB scripting. And we got a couple of function here, uh, including, let's see, doing a loop. Uh, creating an object here. Okay, that's interesting. Opening a stream, we're writing text and we're saving it to a file. Okay, interesting. And of course you can see all the Windows control characters here. Uh, you're gonna see that in, in this platform or in Linux in general, but um, we also see, oops, back up. Uh, let me go back and see. Oop. Back up, went too far. We also see a process where it actually creates the process though with Reg Server 32. So one thing we could do is take this out. If we wanted to try to extract the file, we can actually take that out maybe and then try running the VB script to 
creates a file, the resultant file that then gets run or processed. Okay, um, I don't really have the, the capability natively to do that here, but if I were to transfer that to another host, you know, that could certainly be possible. So I'm not gonna demonstrate that here. Um, I, I'm kind of gonna leave it at that as far as, as the file analysis portion. Again, you could take different, uh, you know, take different um, hash values and whatnot from these separate, these different files and then use those for uh, later indicators, maybe if it's something of interest. Uh, but that's gonna be it as far as the security onion uh, demonstration here. But I will pivot over here to the slides and clarify on this a little bit more. So let me switch this screen real quick. Let's see. All right, so let me get back over here and I'm just gonna go through these. This is really for the folks that are not gonna be able to watch the video. I figured I'd include some stuff here for them to be able to go over and for folks to go over after uh, the presentation. So it just walks through what we just spoke. And real quick, uh, just to recap. So that sequence of events, we see that get request initially all the way down to those three posts, right? To the thumb EKS. Uh, and we didn't know before about the files delivered or drop, but now we do know there is a VBS file. And using network miner, we were able to extract that out of that zip file. We're able to go down and look through the, the function there. And this is really what I was mentioning we want to end up with, right? <clears throat> and so after modifying the VBS and running it on a test Windows host, we can run C script and we can actually have it perform that action, right? And so what happens is that this file, whenever I ran C script, the name of the VBS file, it exported itself into users Bass Master Great name, by the way, app data local temp, right? And it was a file called adobe.txt. So I got that file hash, the SHA-256 sum. And virus it'll set this hansitter. Okay, so now I've got some more work to do, you know, going and investigating on the host and, and performing some cleanup and maybe some remediation, but uh, definitely a lot of, you know, a lot of direction. Uh, where to go now, and a lot more visibility than maybe I wouldn't have had, um, you know, not using something like Security Onion. And really, it all started here. Uh, it was from a mail spam, uh, so an email purporting to be related to, uh, of course, our, our COVID crisis uh, right now, which is, um, of course, not very favorable, but it is working for some folks. And uh, so that's that's kind of how this all started. And then we've got some other indicators that if you're reviewing the slides, you can go through. And then what can we do with these indicators, right? I mean, they're great. Um, you know what? I mean, sometimes they're worth, they're worth something and sometimes they're worth less, right? It just really depends. But uh, what you can do, you can use the Zeek Intel framework uh, to generate Zeek notices. Um, if you use MISP, you can load them to MISP and you can still get uh, you know, Suricata signatures and Zeek Intel from MISP. So if you're already doing that in MISP, that's great. We can do that. Or you can write NIDS rules, write Elast Alert rules, or write Sigma rules. And you can even convert those Sigma rules to Elast Alert rules and then use those in Security Onion. And I just want to give a shout out to Andy Pease, uh, Dustin Lee, uh, Brad Duncan, and Mason Matt. Um, there is uh, a write-up on SANS about this very thing that you can also go through. Uh, it was uh, very nice to be able to, to refer to and compare uh, as I was going through this. And then also Andy has one on huntops.blue. So I just want to say thanks to those guys. So what's next? I'm going to try to get through this fairly quickly because I know I'm running a little short on time. But uh, Security Onion Hybrid Hunter, this is our next big thing that we've been working on and we've been developing it a ton and putting a lot of, a lot of man hours into. It's going to support CentOS and Ubuntu. Right? Packages are going to be replaced with Docker containers. Salt stack is going to be used for that automation and orchestration of the stack. It's going to make the sensor grid so much easier to manage. Um, it's going to make grid statistics, being able to gain statistics about your uh, servers and forward nodes and whatnot. It's going to make it awesome. Um, and then, of course, there are plans to 
um, even have a more unified interface there in Hybrid Hunter. So Hybrid Hunter includes the Hive and Cortex. If you've heard of them before, um, then you'll know that they're great for alert triage, incident management. If you want to enrich observables using their analyzers or perform response actions based on certain data that you bring in or cases, you can do that with responders. And then Soctopus. So Soctopus is a Flask API that we present in uh, Hybrid Hunter. And you can push an event from Kibana to the Hive if you want to investigate that further. You can push an event from Kibana to MISP. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can tie in and, and do different things. And there's a lot of automation going on behind the scenes with that as well. Playbook is another huge one. Josh Brower has done an awesome job on Playbook and, and helping us uh, implement detection orchestration with Sigma and those last alert rules that I spoke of. Also, uh, automating the uh, importing or the insertion of the Hive case templates into the Hive so that whenever we have an alert um, that's maybe generated from a Sigma rule, we already have the steps defined uh, that we want to go take on those alerts. Uh, so a lower level, lower level analyst can go off and do those quickly, um, and then even remind a higher, you know, a, a tier, a higher tier analyst uh, of the steps to take as well. And then we can check that attack coverage. We can check it with Attack Navigator to to look at the the layers of coverage there, right? Based on our detection logic that we have deployed. Another huge one Josh has been working on is OS Query and Fleet integration. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows host telemetry data is awesome to have and tie in with our network data. And we can also perform live and scheduled queries with that. Um, and it really helps with that centralized agent management there. Stroka, uh, if you've heard of SFF, FSF or file scanning framework, uh, Stroka is a similar concept. It's uh, automated file analysis at scale written in Go. And it allows us to take those extracted files, uh, those files extracted by Zeek or other files that you have on your network that you want to analyze. Uh, and perform analysis, get additional metadata. Um, you can even use Yara or integrate it with Cuckoo. Uh, it's super awesome in that regard. And then PCAP, uh, Google Stenographer, will be replacing NetSniff NG. Uh, we're gonna get a great performance improvement with that, I think, and uh, also the ability to index that PCAP, right? So indexing a PCAP uh, may mean faster retrieval and whatnot, and just uh, you know easier search and that sort of thing. Uh, and then also Sensoroni, uh, Jason Ertl uh, has just joined, joined us recently. Before then, he had helped us uh, to develop Sensoroni, and this will be the CatMe replacement, CatMe, what you just saw a few minutes ago. Uh, Sensoroni is written in Go, and it also supports that same PCAT retrieval and transcript, transcript rendering, and uh, will likely evolve to, to something a bit more in the near future. Another thing that uh, I want to focus on uh, real quick is cloud. All right, we, we just had a brief discussion about cloud here before me, but um, you know, in that same vein, AWS, uh, we now have a community AMI in AWS that's currently in testing, and we would love for you guys to help us test it out and try it in your environments. We have a guide on read the docs, uh, which I negligently left out of this slide, which I once I post the slides, I will add that in there. But we also have uh, a, the ability to spin it up quickly and easily using Terraform. So if you have an AWS account, or if you don't have one and you want to set one up real quick, and you don't know how to set up a VPC and all that, um, it will automatically create a VPC, security groups, um, mirroring config, and then you can have that instance spun up and testing with it and playing with it super quickly and easily. And I just want to give a shout out to Dustin Lee again, uh, Johnny J. Mann. Cyber War Dog, uh, Roberto Rodriguez, and uh, Chris Long Centurion, uh, because they did a lot of work with uh, you know, Detection Lab, and also they did some great stuff with the Hulk, and then Dustin, of course, with some security and additions uh, for this Terraform stuff. So I just want to say thanks. And with that, I was trying to speed through those last slides to make sure I made it through. I think I am done. So I will open it up uh, for questions if anybody has any questions and um, yeah, that's about it. All right, let me see. Where, where, where? Give me just a minute here to unmute the track detect channel. Um, all right, let me scroll up just a bit. 
crypto licks while Wes is scrolling through and reading things. I saw that you raised your hand in uh, in the Zoom webinar. Uh, all of our interactions are being driven through the Slack channel. So if you just want to bounce over there and post uh, and, and post your question there, Wes will will take care of it for you there. Okay. Okay. So I see ethical infosec. Um, is there a way to integrate a CTI feed? Um, it depends specifically on, on I guess what you're referring to, but um, Pretty much anywhere where where we can grab that data from, um, you know, from an API or or whatnot. Uh, if you have that data in a file, um, if we need to massage that, we can do that. Um, it, I think it just really depends on on specific ones that we already support out of the box. Um, I see one for I see Matt Carruthers. Are there plans to integrate Security Onion with Moloch? It seemed very complimentary. Um, we've had a few questions about that. We don't necessarily have any intentions of doing that, um, at least not at this time. Let's see if there's anyone, anyone else? Sorry, I'm just scrolling here, through here. All right. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. So I uh, appreciate the, uh, the feedback guys. And um, you know, I'll be here for the next minute or so if you still need one last question, but other than that, that's all I have.